Good afternoon and welcome to the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation's virtual training session on implementing NAVSIG's incident symbology. We do have a couple of instructors that we'll be introducing momentarily. First, I would just like to highlight that the session is being recorded and for questions today, we'll be using the Q&A feature within WebEx. We would like to encourage you to use that, so feel free to start typing in your questions throughout as they come to mind. What we would do is select a handful of questions which we will be able to cover at the end of today's seminar. Next slide. So you will have two instructors for this training session. We have Chris Rogers, Lieutenant with the Kirkland Fire Department, who also serves as a technical advisor with NABSIG, including, but definitely not limited to, symbology and pre-planning. Chris, can you give a few words on your background? Yeah, thanks, Terry. Uh, yeah, I've got uh, 27 years of fire civics experience, but uh, also have a degree in cartography, which is the original GIS degree. Um, managed to keep on messing with that over the years and uh, look forward to your questions and um, your feedback. Excellent, thank you, Chris. And we appreciate your time and technical expertise that you'll be sharing with us today. I am Terry Martin, a program specialist here with NABSIG. I will be doing a lot of the Q&A and moderation as well as a brief introduction. Now, I've only been with NAPSIG a short time, however, I've worked with the organization on a number of efforts over the last seven years as an SME and served on the regional leadership teams. Prior to NAPSIG, I worked at the county and municipal levels as a GIS analyst and coordinator, respectively. I supported emergency management, police, fire, and emergency services, as well as our 911 communication centers. Next slide. So for those of you who are new to our organization, I'd just like to briefly talk about who we are. The National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We have a national network of over 8,000 members, both public safety and GIS practitioners alike, representing local, state, tribal, county levels, as well as a number of working groups. And today you'll learn a little bit about the work of the Symbology Working Group in particular, and you can learn how to potentially get involved. Our organization is governed by an independent board of directors. They are primarily public safety practitioners with 30 plus years of experience in the field. We formed over 10 years ago as an alliance between a number of prominent national associations, some of which you see here and have evolved into a formal organization over the course of that time. So our vision as an organization is listed here, but at its core is to help build a nation of emergency responders and leaders equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying technology and data to change the outcome of survivors and really working toward building a more resilient nation. Next slide. So the purpose of today's virtual training is to provide you all with some basic awareness level training on the symbology guideline and symbol stats, and to show you how you can implement the symbology guideline in your agency, as well as how to develop your own symbols for your own specific agency's needs. So there are a few key objectives that we will be covering today. You will learn what the symbology guideline and symbol set is. You will learn why and how to implement the guideline in your agency to support a consistent language for communicating incident information. You will learn how to discover and consume symbols in a variety of formats. And you will gain insight into the efforts thus far and still underway in 2017 for expanding the symbol set and enhancing the implementation tools. And lastly, we will be looking for you to share your ideas on potential enhancements to the symbol library tool. So what is the purpose of NAPSIG symbology? So as I just mentioned, the purpose of the standardized symbology is really to consistently communicate incident information on maps. Additionally, to gain efficiencies in mutual aid planning, readiness and response and to also enhance operational coordination across the entire community, and really how it all began by addressing the needs of the first responder community in their daily preparedness efforts and incident response. But in short, it's to have a common incident language through common symbols. 
So before we get too far, I do want to cover a few pieces of key terminology that you'll see and hear throughout the session. We want to be sure that everyone has a basic level of familiarity with some of these terminologies and acronyms. So to probably state the obvious here, but symbology, which is our topic today, is the study or interpretation of symbols. And both PNG and SVG are file formats that we make our symbology available in. And the purpose is to allow for the use across mapping platforms and environments. And lastly is style sheet. It's really a file that allows you to pull in that full symbol set by uh, any one of those categories. So here is the agenda for the session today. I will start off with a brief introduction of our organization and the Symbology Project, and then I will hand it off to Chris Rogers, who will dive into the guideline and demonstrate some techniques for accessing and implementing the guideline in a number of environments. And finally, we will conclude with participant questions and answers. And as a reminder, uh, all this recording and the materials used in today's seminar will be made available on our website. So just want to highlight that as this is a question we commonly receive. So please feel free to enter in those questions as we move along. So to begin, what is the Incident Symbology Program? In short, we've produced a combination of different resources that you will learn about today. The most fundamental of those resources, which Chris will cover in more detail, is the Incident Symbology Guideline. The guideline is a flexible and scalable framework for use, particularly by GIS practitioners, in developing and applying map symbols and public safety maps. We recognize that while we have several hundred symbols developed, there are only symbols that we might not have or symbols that may not work for a very specific application and use. So this framework provides that flexible and scalable basis to be able to modify and create symbols that may not exist or may not meet your needs. The symbol sets shown here grouped by category on the right are sets of specific and discrete symbols that we have worked with the community to develop to meet specific symbol needs and to help achieve that symbol standardization when possible and feasible across all emergency response and management functions and across all disciplines from wildland to structural fire to search and rescue, law enforcement, mass care, and so on. So in addition to the symbol set available, yes, and I can do that. One of the questions was to put the uh, link in the chat. And all this will be available um, in the materials. So uh, in addition to that uh, symbol library, we have uh, these tools that are made available to you. The first is an example geodatabase schema, and this is a series of XML documents based on the symbol groups or categories that you can import into your own geodatabase. This is one way to kind of help you get started. We do host REST feature services also by category or symbol packages. And as we mentioned before, a number of different file formats are available via the symbol library tool, also in different file sizes to support a variety of environments, including mobile. And you also have the ability to not, um, to not download and consume the entire symbol set, uh, but to select the ones you need and add them in like an a la carte fashion for download. Sorry, you can go to the next slide. Thanks, Chris. So some quick facts on the symbology set to date and how we got here. We have about 700 symbols in our symbol set to date, and that will talk about some additional symbols that will be added later this month. The development of the symbol set and ultimately its success is based upon the methodology for which they've been developed. Through this process, we have had over 70 state, local, tribal, and territorial stakeholders serve on the symbology working group. And they are representative across disciplines from fire and police to the park service, search and rescue, and so on. Additionally, we've conducted a formal national survey on the current state of symbology and where gaps exist. 
In the actual development of the symbol set, we evaluated and researched several different standards that were in existence. The NAFSIG symbology guideline is really a mashup of all the standards and projects you see on the bottom right. Some of these you may be familiar with, like ANSI 415, which is the Homeland Security Working Group and the National Wildfire Coordinating Group symbol set. But we also looked into some international groups and some non-conventional sources like the Noun Project which is an open source icon sharing site. And a lot of those icons went into supplementing the UN Office of Humanitarian Affairs symbol set. So there's already a lot of cross-pollination between the symbol sets, and what we did was bring them together within a common framework. And lastly, we continue to work with software providers like Esri on incorporating the NAPSIG guidance and styles into their offerings. So I do want to mention here our standards philosophy. Traditionally, public safety disciplines adopt standards exclusively from specific SDOs. And often these standards are not flexible and incapable of rapid updates required to meet evolving technologies and lessons learned. They can also be cost prohibitive to implement and working group members may be required to pay in order to participate. In contrast, we have worked to participate and stay engaged in support of multiple SDO-based standards development across disciplines and technology standard bodies. As you will hear, we have continued to seek stakeholder feedback via no-cost working groups. We've worked to fill gaps that require more nimble and agile solutions and tools. And equally important, we develop and disseminate tools to the community that enable and expedite implementation to maintain currency and value. So how did we get to where we are today? Oh, um, SDO, I apologize, is a standard development organization. So how did we get to where we are today? The process really started at a very local and grassroots level. Uh, a work group started by local fire and law enforcement who came together to discuss how to view public safety information on a map and to discuss, discuss what currently existed and where there were gaps. As you can see, what started with a discussion of mapping symbols in support of NIMS and ICS and pre-incident planning really evolved over the years. Throughout, both public safety operators and GIS practitioners have been engaged and offered feedback. And lastly, you can see how the framework has expanded to include access hazards, hazardous materials, search and rescue, symbols for incident types and public alert and warnings as well as over 150 infrastructure symbols aligned with homeland and infrastructure foundation level data or high field. And as the symbol set expanded, our offerings for access and consumption of the symbols has grown to include those symbol library tools I discussed over those last few slides. And I also just want to mention briefly that beyond the very close collaboration we've had with our, our state and local tribal and territorial communities. We also work closely with our federal agency partners. And these are really just a few of the key activities and areas of collaboration um, that we've been partnering with on the federal side. And with that, I will close out the history and introduction portion of our training session and turn it over to Chris Rogers who will share more details on the guideline and then get into the more technical mechanics of implementing our standard symbology. So with that, over to you, Chris. Thanks, Terry. So we, I, I've been with this process since the very beginning, and we've actually, it's been a very exciting process from starting from a very grassroots, uh, small number of folks to, to uh, debate, discuss, and decide on what, what the best practices are for mapping features on a broad categories and map to expanding to several different categories. And so we've developed a uh, production methodology, if you will. And basically, the, the, the one key thing I highlight is we constantly test and reevaluate. Um, we realize based on uh, usability in mobile products, based on paper usability, and actually even based on uh, being able to hand draw the symbols yourself. For example, even though technology, and I'm a big advocate, technology is great, you'd still need to have a fallback to be able to communicate on how to hand draw a symbol. 
But one big thing I do want to highlight is, is that we do real world validation and action. The reason why this webinar was postponed is because we were heavily involved with uh, the disasters of Hurricane Irma and Har Harvey, and we've tested uh, the evaluated the workflow that we provided, and we have we're going to be going through many uh, bits of iteration and feedback for uh, some time to come. So why a guideline? Well, a guideline is flexible and scalable, and you know, being in the, in the fire service, you know, standards are great, but you need something that's a bit flexible and scalable. And one of the best features of not only the fire service, but the public safety community is the history of ICS involving the NIMS. And the key to that is, is that it's flexible and scalable so you can modify it and use it based on varying different scales and sizes and types of incidents. So we kind of adopted that same kind of methodology to designing our, our, our symbology. Also, by creating a guideline, again, as Terry mentioned, we don't have the ability to map and create a symbol for every single thing, because there's always going to be something that pops up. So by having a guideline, we provide the user the ability to create their own symbol as they see need the, the, when they see or need to be created. Also, by having a guideline, we help start to socialize the shapes and qualities and design of symbols to represent different things. For example, I'll get to it in, in a future slide, but hazards are represented by a diamond, and you don't necessarily need to know what that symbol is specifically. If you get used to the idea that a diamond is a hazard, if you look at it on the map, you'll know that you need to be aware of something related to that feature. So I bring this slide up because you know, being in the fire service, we like to have to take ownership in some of the terminology we use. And you know, in my local jurisdiction, we call these aid cars and medic units, but in other places they call it several different uh, terms or a different interpret type of uh, unit. Typically, you know, technically speaking, it's a, a ambulance, but it could be any number of things. And the fire service, especially, likes that autonomy and that quality of having some some flexibility in some of their naming. So we also kind of adopt some similar practices to design the symbols and have the ability for different groups to modify as they see fit. However, with that said, you know, the one big key for having a consistent design is communicating the same exact thing. And this is actually a sample related to last week. We, uh, both Terry and I were working with Hurricane, the Hurricane Irma incident and we had the exact same feature layer, but representing in two different renderings. And so by having a consistent guideline of how you render a certain feature, you could have that um, features in the same web map being the same thing. Uh, both of these are storm surge uh, color ramps is showing the various, uh, uh, indicating the various level of hazard associated with it, but they actually were rendered differently. So from the very beginning, you know, as a group, we just realized that emergency responders need maps to do certain things. They need, first of all, to go to the, the uh, be able to locate the problem they're going to or responding to, and that's obvious. But we also need maps to identify hazards, to show people and equipment that were, were located so we could solve the problem, and to identify features that already exist on the map to help fix the problem. So we adopted initially three categories, incident symbology, pre-incident symbology, and hazard symbology to start our process to create symbols. However, as time went along, we realized that there was other needs related to emergency mapping. We needed to support symbology to inform the public. We needed to create symbols to support critical infrastructure. And also, and this is uh, recent, we also need symbology to note calls of service or 911 calls. And not every call is an emergency type, but we need to be able to map and identify the location of the call and symbolize that differently from a hazard. So we developed guidance for public alert and warnings, critical infrastructure, and 911 call typing or 911 calls for service. But additionally, the key is it's flexible, scalable, and based on the scale and the design of the map, you know, you have some latitude to design and maintain the symbol. But just key to remember, if all else fails, 
pledge is important and attributes associated with the feature are important. So simple categories. The first category is incident symbology. And we decided that since we can't rely on technology, we need to use map symbols as if we were drawing a piece of paper. So we decided some, uh, that incident symbology need to be clear with a uh, white or clear background. And it, this is information that's managed during the incident. So three subcategories are incident resources and command features, unit symbology, and NIMS or NIMS command structure locations. And additionally, we symbolized or pseudo symbolized exposures with noting the A, B, C, D exposures with, a, with an italics around it. Again, all these symbols are something that if you need to, you can hand draw in a pinch, especially the incident resource and command features and also relates to something fairly similar. For example, in NIMS, the command structure location, that's very similar to the, the unit symbology and the command structure symbology within military symbology. So some examples are base, evacuation features, staging, fire hydrant, uh, camps, and civilian staging. These are all very similar and they kind of derive from the NWCG guideline that a lot of our members had experience with. However, you can never guarantee that you're going to have it, that symbol fit everything. So we have some symbol modifiers is what we call them. And so in this case, uh, dash line, and it can be a feature that's in the future planned or not in use. And we derive that guideline from the, the MCNA symbology, which is actually Australian uh, emergency map symbology. And also we can note, um, use arrows to denote either like at a place of a symbol or if the arrow points out away from the symbol, it could be a direction of travel, or it could be a reading that you're not, you're, you're reading some kind of feature in the distance. It could be a compass azimuth arrow. There's also uh, an, all the exceptions. For example, the command post symbol has been largely socialized to the community, especially the wildland community for quite some time. So we just advise to put clear text next to it to, to keep it uh, explanatory for lay users that may not know what, the, what it is. And also doing color treatments to represent some kind of value. In this case, this is a treatment uh, point, And we, if you have a place uh, where green patients need to go, you can just note it by the color green. Then the next thing is pre-planned features. And these are symbols that are derived from NFPA and they have a color background. And this is because you assume that even if you had to hand draw these symbols on a piece of paper, you can take time to colorize them and use magic marker or whatever device. And so these are the, the categories associated with including access point, ventilation, utility shut off, assessment features, water shut off, and detectors, and also location of features. And this is geared mostly towards pre-building pre-incident planning, which a number of our members and users have already uh, started using. Now, this is the most important symbol I feel of all, and that's the uh, hazard symbol. And really it's important because you need to map or locate things that either need to be fixed by the responders or need to be avoided. And this is actually derived from several hazard type uh, guidelines, including NFPA 704, CHS incident symbology, hazmat plot area, and even street signs use that kind of diamond feel to, because uh, it uh, sticks out and it's, um, provides some, some ready awareness. So again, the diamond, we, use, we have several uh, categories of hazard symbology, including natural hazards, access hazards, man-made hazards, has, has it mats hazards, or hazardous materials, and any specific hazards. And it could be very ad hoc, and it could be something that you can design yourself. Now, infrastructure is something that came up to uh, the need to uh, symbolize a high field infrastructure layers. However, this isn't necessarily exclusive to high field, but we use high field as the basis for our uh, work to create, generate symbols. And this is a rectangle with rounded corners on the edges, around the corners. Public alerts are symbols that support the IPAWS initiative and here, a rounded triangle with a red, orange, or blue outline. 
And finally, the, the new one is uh, CAD option symbology or CAD symbology. This is actually just in the incipient stages. And we're using a oval for this process because one, actually it looks good on some products like Pulse Point and Situation Analyst. And they use the oval to represent a call. Plus it also provides uh, some width if, in case you need to label it. And also it actually looks uh, nice with uh, if you use a teardrop design as well. So it's completed as far as this month, we've completed over 60 infrastructure symbols in these broad categories, uh, two event codes, and we've standardized a symbol framework for law enforcement types of calls and service. Uh, we also focused on priority symbols for health and assets for DHS and OHA. But however, we're only about 6% complete with the high field symbology. Now, color ramp. So this is actually, we have a specific color ramp design. If you notice in the table, it's not geared or tied to a specific standard, but it basically indicates either no severity or increased severity from green all the way to purple. And the RGB values and hex values are associated with that. And if you saw from our previous example, using that, that ramp or guideline would have provided some information that would have been continuous regarding that example. These are kind of secondary modifiers or treatments, and they work both the polygons and points, as well as lines as well, and can be used to indicate status or severity of a particular thing. So in this example, we use the tornado hazard symbol uh, from ES scale zero all the way to five, and we use the color ramp to, to, to indicate the severity of it. Also, you notice on the right-hand image, you see a hot zone indicating this is the bad area and a warm zone using the yellow color to indicate the transition zone, warm zone, or the outer perimeter. So in the symbology library tool, we have, we can support a variety of, variety of formats from desktop GIS to online web mapping and also other technologies, namely Google Earth through a KML format which uses a PNG style. And we have a lot of symbols, guidelines, uh, implementation guidances, and map templates. This is, again, publicly not available at no cost. And I'm pleasantly surprised when I look and evaluate maps from various departments and agencies. I see our work embedded in a lot of those agencies, and that's awesome, because that's exactly what it was intended for. It's uh, easily searchable and discoverable, and eases and automates the use of integration. So I'm gonna go through some demonstrations. I'm gonna go through four key demonstrations and I'm gonna create a simple math for Google Earth, which is in a bit of a transition. It's we're going from the desktop to the browser version. I'll address that, some comments or some, uh, some questions related to that here in a bit. I'm gonna create a simple map and symbolize it using our, our symbols in AGOL. Then I'm gonna show a, a web map, uh, web application using a infrastructure data. And then I'm going to show, actually, instead of that, I'm going to show a demonstration of how to create your own symbol. And that's one of the common uh, things we get feedback on is we don't have a symbol for a certain thing. And what's exciting is now people are actually starting to say, I don't have a, I don't see you don't have a symbol for this. So I just took the guideline and created a symbol for it. And that's awesome. That's exactly what the guideline was intended for. So I want to start with that. Using, uh, and demonstrating how to use our symbols in Google Earth. Uh, the benefits of it, it's free and easy to use, and it's good for sharing a small amount of data. Now, I'll, I'll address a challenge. Google Earth just recently released their updated browser version, which doesn't support editing KML directly. However, you can still download Google Earth. They call it Google, it's actually for Google Earth Pro, that used to have to pay for, but now it's free, you can edit and create KML in that. Also, you can create KML in some KML editors and in uh, ArcGIS Desktop and ArcGIS Pro. So let me switch screens. So you notice uh, I have Google Earth. Terry, just confirm you see Google Earth, correct? Yes, I can see it. Okay, and actually, now that you zoomed in, this is my hometown where I live. So if you, I live on the furthest northwest portion of the United States. 
And so to add a symbol to the map, you just want to create a place mark. I'm going to say I'm going to add a, a base location. So which is in the guideline, it's a circle with a B around it. I'm going to do base. Just type in base here. And then here in the upper right-hand corner, you see a symbol button. You'll notice it's not in there. So what I need to go is do is go to the symbol tool. None. And I'll just search up here for base. Oh, there it is right there. I'll click the I. And this is the vectoral way of doing it, but you can get the link to that image by right clicking. And this is um, Google Chrome. And you can copy the link address. In Internet Explorer and Edge, it's not as readily available. You'll have to go down into the properties of that link to get it. But Chrome and Firefox are both nice that you can copy the link address. So I'll copy the link address for the 64 um, by 64 uh, image. Go back to Google Earth. Add custom icon. Hit OK. And you'll see that the circle B is there. And that is it. And the nice thing about this is if I need to, I could actually right click on this and say email a colleague of the locations of a certain thing that's certain related to an incident. Uh, again, this isn't like a good way to manage data, but for quick and dirty, and if you don't have any resources to map, this is a good, simple way to use our symbology and link it directly to a map that can be shareable across multiple people. Stand by. Uh, okay, don't know why I did that, but we should be fine. I'll just have to zoom to the uh, particular slide. You know, sometime Murphy was going to, I'll tell you, if there's any questions, I can address that real quick. Um, That's sometimes the mixed blessings of uh, hosting your presentation over the cloud. So the next thing I'm going to demonstrate is uh, symbolizing a web map uh, with our symbology using ArcGIS Online. I'm going to take a feature service uh, that uh, exists in another location and symbolize it using our symbology. Now, the benefits of ArcGIS Online and other web mapping applications is that it's nice to maintain data. It, you can share it across platforms, whether through a browser, a mobile device. Uh, you can share it uh, uh, with different organizations or internally, and it has some security associated with it. Also, you can do a lot of analysis and just simple map reduction. And as, as anybody who are active users of ArcGIS Online or other web mapping applications could attest, it's kind of nice because if you're using it, all of a sudden it'll be upgraded and you'll get more functionality without even realizing it. So let me hold that slide right there. And I have a web map in, in ArcGIS Online, and there's a layer I have called Some Large Stores. And this is actually a feature service by a, a large company that uh, has stores all over the United States. But you notice that the symbology is just a dot. It just comes in a 
however, you know, they render it and stuff. So it, it's not really anything substantive or actually tells anything. So I'm going to, in this other tab, show you that I actually have posted on my ArcGIS line count the stores uh, symbol from the NAPSIC library. And I'm going to show this. You could use the link from our NAPSIC site. But this is another option that you should be aware of because sometimes it's nice to have that symbol packaged in the same service. And so I uploaded this symbol earlier to my ArcGIS Online account, and I shared it with everybody. And that's the key. So you need to share it with everybody uh, online. And on the bottom right-hand corner, you have the link associated with that symbol. Just copy it. And just go to the Symbols tool, Change Style. And I'm going to just do it by show location only. You have other options to symbolize it as well. And if you're a heavy user of ArcGIS Online, you're already aware of these. Just click that, click Symbols, and I'll prompt me to change the symbol. And you'll notice in this the, the tray that has some basic, very basic symbols that are very generic or vanilla in nature. So I need to add a customized symbol to this. And I, have, I already copied my URL for my image. Paste it. And you notice it ends up in my symbol tray on the bottom right-hand corner. And I'm going to just go ahead and increase the size so that you can see. And now it's symbolized with uh, consistent symbology. Now, the reason why I advocate for this, I want to show this, is that let's say you have store X and you have store Y. And they're both giving you feeds for like if they're open or closed, or maybe they actually have some actual data associated with a disaster. You can symbolize store X and store Y the same way and gives you a sort of a status or a broad overview of what's going on in your community. So the next thing I want to show is using Web App Builder to create a customized application based on uh, changing the status of a feature on the windshield survey. And this is something I demoed in my own department on how you'd use Web App Builder to replace what really is a, was a labor-intensive workflow and simple, simplify it and distribute that application to multiple users. So you're going to see here, I have, if, if you're not familiar with Web App Builder, there are plenty of tutorials and uh, learning sources online, but what I did was I created a web map based on high field data and I added a field to it that showed or indicated damage. From there, I symbolized that layer with the color ramp, green being it's in service or okay, and up to red meaning it's totally damaged. And so it used to be for this work, we used to go out and manually update this, these features, just call it in on the radio that this school was damaged and then it would go back to the EOC and they would note it and put a pin on the map. With this application, I was able to demonstrate that you can actually go, click on a button, and see, you know what, everything in this northeast port of town is damaged. I can click, draw on it, and it's going to prompt me hit of two things, if it's an in-service and if it's damaged. So I'm going to say, you know what, everything is fairly destroyed here hit save, and you see that the symbols change to red, indicating the, the status of, of damage associated with those features. And I'm showing you actually the, the web app builder part to expose that this is how you edit the features. Uh, this is a really nice tool because it's basically, as somebody likes to put it, you're creating an application with, without killing code. And so it's just a lot of easy widgets you can add to a map, drag and drop, change the settings of it to provide certain functionality. And it used to be that this type of application would have to be developed by a lot of code. And I just, and I just able to demonstrate that you could actually develop an application in about an hour to do a particular workflow. So finally, I'm going to show, and if, if you're not uh, very technical or graphic uh, design in nature, don't worry about it. But I want to show how we kind of uncover how we design 
and taking creator symbols. And I want to show it because, again, it, one of our common questions we get asked is, hey, how come you don't have a symbol for this? Or I couldn't find a symbol for this. Could you do something? And so I wanted to show that, in fact, you can actually create your own symbol if, if needed as well. And I use a program called Inkscape, which is freeware. And it's open source. It's uh, the same as Adobe Illustrator. Adobe Illustrator is a lot better. But um, if you need to in a pinch, Inkscape works very, very well. And you basically need three components of to create your symbol. You need the shape that's consistent with our guideline, a background, and in this case, we mostly use white, and a graphic. And some icon sources of graphic sources are Noun Project and Free Clip Art. And we find a lot of sources, and also, admittedly, I also draw my own in case if it doesn't fit, but, um, or the other options, you just use common labeling or acronyms, for example, if you didn't have a symbol for uh, command post, and I'll just say that for argument purposes, you could just use CP for command post and it'll make sense, wrapped around a circle. So here's a view of actually our border infrastructure symbology, and I won't go into too much as far as like design, but you'll notice that there's three basic layers. There is the base layer or the background, and you can see that I have color options associated with it. So that's the base part of the, or the base layer, the shape, background shape. You have the graphic, and then you have the shape. So if you wanted to, you could change the shape of the, the wrap around it, but for consistency, they're all, in this case, infrastructure. They're all a rectangle with rounded corners. So here are some examples of users actually using our symbology for their projects. And this is actually the most exciting one for me because this is kind of how the project started was, was printing and planning. And it's really exciting because I'll go around the country or go to presentations and people will be actually using our symbology in their maps and we'd have no idea. And so we'll be creating web maps and applications using ArcGIS Collector to collect data. Uh, some use Survey123 to collect some information. And this is a, was from a, a department in Maryland, and I had no clue they were using this, so, and it was great. And there's other examples, Dallas, uh, Southern Florida, uh, LA, all kinds of departments around the area that have used some components of our symbology in their maps. This is an example of a web briefing app. And what's notable about this is that it uses our infrastructure symbology and also the widget onto the right and also the uh, symbols um, indicating uh, schools and hospitals. Public alert and warnings, which is something we worked extensively on. And not only is the symbology embedded as part of the map, it's also embedded as part of the alert in this case, a tweet associated with it. And again, the, a uh, local EOC mobile app. And what's notable about this slide is not only do they use the symbology on the map, they use the symbology embedded in the, the Survey123 uh, field assessment tool. And so what you have is you have the ability to socialize and cross-pollinate the symbology in a text application and a web map-based application. And finally, the example that I showed indicating the status of uh, critical infrastructure uh, damage. So anyway, we've been working, again, reiterate, we've been working with Esri to integrate the symbols as default symbol options on multiple categories. And they've, as, as have you noticed, they've integrated a lot of our symbols in the templates. Uh, Esri's conducted additional symbol testing and they do provide feedback to us. And many third-party vendors also use the symbology and their tools, including non-GIS-based applications or Google, Google Earth or Google Maps-based applications. Again, this, these are the tools and the, the resources provide. They're all at the link below. 
And also I want to extend a big thank you to colleagues and associates that have helped through this process over the years. And here's a list from all over the country, all across the disciplines that have helped us out with this process. And this is only a small uh, list of everybody has done some with us. From that, I'll take your questions. So, Chris, I will start. Um, anyone feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A box and WebEx. Um, in the meantime, I have a couple that came through. Um, the first was, would you mind, Chris, going back to uh, Google Earth? Um, the question was, can you show one or more time where the Symbology Editor tool was with the Google Earth Pro tools? Um, I guess, uh, uh, do you have both, do you have the other one downloaded or are you just using the, oh, you are with Pro, okay. Yeah, I'm using Google Earth Pro. And the other option okay. is using de uh, ArcGIS Desktop. Um, but, you know, ArcGIS is, is a pay and this is free. And within Google Earth Pro, is there a um, Symbology Editor tool? Yes, that you're there is. Aware Let of? me review that. Uh, not a Symbology editor. I'll tell you what. Let me go back and change the properties of the symbol. So if you okay. click on the the, um, I'll just say I'm going to change this base to something else, just something random. I right click on base, go to properties, and in the upper right hand corner there's a button. There is a palette of symbols that come already embedded with ArcGIS or excuse me, Google Earth. Um, so I'll just change it to the that icon. So that's what comes stock with um, with uh, Google Earth. I can change it back to the customized symbols that we have based on the link from our website. In this case, it's it's this link that I just highlighted above. Hit OK and it changes it back. There is no way to um, it, Google Earth consumes a PNG file, and so there's no other way to create a symbol unless you do it in some um, Microsoft Paint or Paint.net or some other raster-based uh, tool. That, hopefully that answers that question. Okay, great. And uh, lastly, well, I have a couple more. First, could you pull up, do you have the, the Symbology Library Tool website? You could just pull up. We had a slide a minute ago on the technical implementation tools, but I think it would be helpful if we just looked at that at the website where you can see everything kind of laid out. Uh, so if Chris sure. pulls that up, you'll see um, these are all the the different categories where you can download full um, packs, as they're called, for each of the different categories here, or you can go in as he did earlier and just click on some. Uh, you know, one specific symbol or multiple and download them, uh, as we had mentioned, a la carte. And would you mind going back mm -hmm. to the previous page? No, I'm sorry, the, the main symbology library uh, tool oh, page. got it. With all the resources, That's thank what, you. Yeah, let me, uh, so it, from go. our website, you navigate to resources tab on the upper uh, top part of the screen, scroll down to symbol library tool, and then here's the associated rest endpoints, sample maps, uh, paper documents and supporting uh, the guideline. And then if you want to go to the symbol library tool, click this icon, and it brings up a website with what we call cards associated with our guideline and category, symbol categories. Do you, Terry, do you just want me to go through and demonstrate how to download and how to navigate through the site? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. So you have several different options, and I'll give you a couple of scenarios. So let's say, for example, you want to download everything associated with a, a certain card. In this case, let's just say uh, hazards. You have the option to view details or download pack. If you hit download pack, what it does, you'll notice in my bottom left-hand part of the screen, it downloads a zip file with true type fonts, the PNGs of various sizes, the SVGs, and not the, and then 
the SVG derived from exported rasters, the fonts, and that's it. And then the next update, you'll actually will actually package the raw SVGs that you could use in Inkscape to modify and download yourself. If you want to focus on a particular symbol, you can click on and browse the category. And if you see a symbol that you want, you can either add it or you can hit the um, the uh, I sign and it opens up the uh, particular symbol in a uh, separate page and you can download that, those files individually. And from here, see, so you, so you notice I added the plus sign Say, for example, I want this symbol, this symbol, this symbol, and this symbol. You notice they basically have a shopping cart of icons I could download. Click my icons, and you'll notice that it'll download the icons that I, that I particularly cared about. And you see here in the, in the compressed file, you'll see the hazard symbols that I wanted to download specifically. And I think that covers that. You have different views as well. You have a thumbnail view and you have a list view. And I think, Terry, that covers it, correct? Yeah, I think so. We had, um, before we run out of time, we had one more question that you may uh, be able to provide a little bit more um, background on. Someone was interested in the wildland fire symbology. Okay, well, uh, I'll put a, a bit of a disclaimer. We actually graze and copy, use the symbol, the NWCD symbology directly. However, the authoritative source for the NWCG or wildfire symbology is at, um, that's actually a link I don't, I can't queue up quite yet, but we can include that in the um, follow up notes. But it's a G stop uh, nine, if you Google that, or NWCG map symbology. Uh, that is the authoritative symbology that includes line and polygon symbology that the wildland community uses. But if you notice the symbols that are consistent, that for example, command post, base, staging, et cetera, are the exact same across both sectors. Excellent. Well, I believe, uh, unless anyone else has any burning questions, I believe that is, um, the end of the questions we have for today. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, if you have any burning questions, please feel free to forward those on to us and we'll get to uh, work on getting those right back around to you. As we mentioned earlier, we do encourage you to share your input on any needs and requirements that need to be filled, as well as to share any other standards or symbol work that's going on. We definitely want to know about it so that we can incorporate it into our future efforts. Um, and additionally, uh, so we showed you the symbol library tool, and I just wanted to mention that uh, in one of the previous slides, we had indicated what was coming, and that was about 60 additional symbols that the Symbology Working Group worked through in 2017. Those will be out um, in uh, late September. So feel free to download the packs between now and then, but we will be pushing out an update, which will have um, a whole bunch of uh, more uh, symbols and some and cleaned up some uh, of the tags and things like that. So um, probably in the end of September, early October timeframe, you should be looking for some, some great updates to the Symbology Library tool. And finally, as a reminder, the session today was recorded, and that recording along with the slides from today will be made available on our website, and you will get a notification once those are posted. So thank you all again, and thank you, Chris, very much for your time and expertise today. And this concludes our virtual training. Thank you.